OK, without further ado, let's have the first contribution. Uh, we've asked our speakers from prisons to say briefly how they've coped with the lockdown, how prisoners and families have responded to what they've done, and importantly, what lessons they've learned from the experience which might affect practice and policy in the future uh, after hopefully the virus disappears. So the first two contributions are pre-recorded uh, and the second two will be live. And we start off with Corinne Morgan Armstrong, who can't be here because he's on leave, uh, and Hayley Morris, who are from Park Prison in Bridgend. And Corinne is the head of family services and Hayley is uh, the family intervention is, is a family interventions manager who works with families and prisoners. Corinne was the main architect of the Invisible Walls project, which has attracted a great amount of tension both in the UK and overseas as well. A very innovative project. So uh, if we can hand over, if uh, Katrina can, can run the video, please. Hello, my name is Hayley Morris and I am the Family Interventions Manager at Park. And I'm Corey Morgan Armstrong and I'm the Head of Family Services for Park and for the other Chief Rest Prisons. Okay, so before everything that happened happened, uh, we had a really extensive kind of suite of family interventions and services that we were delivering pretty much every day, seven days a week, um, that have been built up over about 10 years. So it's really well established. We were doing a lot of stuff in here in the prison, but also a lot of stuff in the community with people's families. We were working with schools, uh, working directly with children. We've got a project called Invisible Walls Wales, which has been running for eight years, that works mostly out in the community with the children and families of people in prison. Um, and then in here, we were delivering somewhere in the region of about five to 6,000 uh, visit places per month. So we had about five to six thousand people coming in on domestic visits every four weeks, four to five hundred children coming in a week. So we're doing visits on a huge scale. In, in the first instance, what we wanted to try and maintain was just basic contact. So making sure that people had phone access, decent phone access, that they had extra phone credit that the prison service was, was good enough to fund for all prisons so people were able to make more calls than they would normally and it wouldn't cost them. Uh, we're fortunate in this prison that we you know we're already set up for in-cell uh, uh, phone lines so everyone everyone has a phone in cell here so that culture is well established so um, you know, at pace we found ourselves uh, being involved in sending out tweets uh, updating all the GFRS websites, doing things that normally we, we, we're not really that keyed up to do. And I think our focus really was how are the children out there feeling? Are they worried about their dad, or, you know, mothers, partners, or, you know, are they thinking that dad's in, um, is in danger? So one of the things that we did was um, take pictures of their dads so that we could send the pictures home. This was about a few weeks into COVID now, so the hair might have been a bit longer, they might have had a beard, because all that stopped, you know, the haircutting facilities, everything. So we took pictures and sent them home so the children knew that dad was okay. There's a lot of crisis management, I would say, in the beginning. We were just thinking of all different ways. Um, we did uh, virtual scouts, and that was where Helen, our scout leader in here, sent out um, activities where the children could still gain their scouts badge. So they, there's another connection there. So um, they all know that Helen's on the wing with their dads, and they do the tasks, send them back, um, and then they still get their badge. So that was lovely. Also, Helen contacted Blue Peter, because she thought, well, why not? Let's try and see if they can offer a little blue piece of badge. Um, so anyway, they, they did get back to her and they've given her the instructions how to for the children to gain their badge. So that's her next mission. I, I was really uh, taken aback by how positive in general everyone's mm -hmm. reaction was. But not only the people in prison here, um, but also the vast majority of friends and families that were contacting us. I said I've been here a long time, but I can't remember ever seeing the uh, that same sense of camaraderie between humans. 
uh, on either side of the prison door. You know, during times where things were difficult or just like meal times, you know, staff and people in prison working together, prisoners working together with staff to just do things and help out, get things done. Staff from other areas who normally don't have any contact with prisoners coming in and helping serve food and things like that. We were walking out um, on our way home and one of the prisoners threw a bed sheet out the window which said thank you prison staff yeah. with the rainbow and everything on it and we were we never seen that before. I think there's loads of advantages yeah. and there's loads of learning that's come out of it for a prison generally but I think in our particular area and with regards to children and families one very obvious um, new introduction is purple visits. So this is the virtual visiting that has actually been around for about 10 years in, in other countries, but it's very new in the UK. <clears throat> and the, the COVID situation prompted the prison service to kind of make uh, a decision and, uh, and the whole machinery speeded up probably by about five years into a month. And, and decisions were made quickly about, you know, because it was, it, you know, prison service, no, you know, and it's nice to be able to say that because, you know, without getting on, the, on a soapbox, five, six years ago, before the Lord Farmer review into the impact of prison on children and families, um, the evidence was there, but people weren't really taking much notice of it. Whereas now, post Lord Farmer's review and, uh, and what the inspectors now say about the importance of family contact, really early on, you know, one of the four top priorities that came out from the centre from London about prisons, one of those four was contact with family and friends, as in, this is absolutely critical, got to get this right, otherwise going to have big problems. Because of that, uh, children and families being one of those four big um, critical agenda items for prisons, purple visits uh, was kind of pushed forward and uh, you know went through the, the, bu the bureaucracy very quickly. All the checks were in place, of course, it just happened a lot quicker because of the necessity. So you've got um, a virtual visiting system, a bit like Skype or Zoom, but which has considerably um, better encryption and security, military grade encryption, and has facial recognition technology built into the software and various other uh, tricks. There are advantages to a virtual visit that you can't get on a social visit. And, you know, and I've seen it already just in the month that we've been doing it. You know, a child's birthday, and the father is sitting in here downstairs on purple visits, right there, live in the moment while his daughter was opening her birthday presents. Right, you're never going to do that in a prison visit hall. Mm. You know, his partner's showing, showing him the new wallpaper in the living room, you know? So there are there are things like that. I'm thinking about Christmas and anniversaries and stuff like that. There's so much we can do with it going forward. So I'm really happy that that's happened because uh, we've got, we now have a brand new, you know, really smart intervention with loads of potential to do different things with it. So social visiting, um, obviously that stopped around about last week of March, you know, unprecedented, never happened before, you know, in, uh, as far as I'm aware, anyway, in prison service history in this country, they just kind of bit for everywhere, the plug was just pulled on it, and nothing happened until um, it was, I think, about the end of July, something like that, first week of, first week of August, thereabouts, uh, so there's just nothing, there's no visiting at all, I mean, it was just, you had nothing to, to hold that up against, just an abstract construct that happened. Uh, so having to then reverse engineer the whole visiting process um, and make it COVID secure in line with legislation that's changing all the time, uh, but also prison service rules and regulations, which are often different from, you know, what and here, what the Welsh government was saying to what the English government was saying and all the rest of it, and try and set up, get a really detailed plan that would be approved so that we could open the doors again, which we're obviously really keen to do. So although it's still very limited and we've got a two metre distance rule and you know all the different things that we can and can't do, there's no play area open, so where we're sitting now is all closed, there's no vending machines, you can't even get like a can of coke, you can't get a coffee or anything, uh, you can give them this bottled water. 
there's no interventions running in visits. Normally, this time of year, there'd be so much going on. Mm-hmm. You know, we'd be the visits would be flat out all around visits. We'd have family group interventions running and fun things happening to kids, firefighter for a day, all that sort of stuff. And there's just no, nothing happening at the moment. One one uh, mother that I walked out with, I think in the first week, she was saying to me that um, for her it was worth it. And, uh, and and I said, do you think your your um, your son feels the same? And she said, probably not. But for me, it was worth it. Yeah. And then I and then for me, I thought, right, well, it's worth it then, isn't it? You know, because he's only got to walk from there to there, sit there for you know half an hour or whatever. She actually had to drive a long way, and for her, it was really uplifting. You know, really kind of helped her cope with the situation, just being able to see her son. And, and go off again, you know, it was a boost to her. And that's part of our job is to say to prisoners, you know, you're not, you're not thinking about you right now. Mm. You've got to think your family, your children might want to see you. It might be two meters apart, mm. yeah. but they just need to see you okay. And again, with purple visits, it's about all those people that didn't get visits prior, mm. prior to COVID, because of yeah. all different reasons. Yeah. Families are too far away. Can't yeah, there's so many now. Our figures will actually yeah. go up, won't they, so, with, yeah. with the virtual and the actual social visits. Mm. Yeah, people who can't have visits. There's one guy who's grand, very ill, yeah. absolutely, absolutely dying, absolutely out of the question that she would travel, even if she lived locally. Mm. But can have a purple visit. From yeah. her bed, because yeah. yeah. she's very you know, amazing. Okay, right. Um, okay, thank you very much. That's that's. Please, um, you know, put any comments or questions in the chat box, and we'll we'll pick them up. Um, the next one is also a video, and this is um, from uh, Eastwood Park Prison, which is um, a women's prison in north of Bristol. For those who don't know, and this is Haley. Simpson, who works for the charity Save for Wales in the resettlement team. Uh, she's the resettlement team manager in Eastwood Park, and she's recorded the following comments about the situation there. She preferred to re- record the talk, but she's here in person to answer questions later, uh, <coughs> as um, as is Hayley Morris from the previous video. So could you run uh, uh, Hayley Simpson's video, please? Hello everyone, my name is Hayley Simpson and I work for Safer Wales. Uh, I manage the resettlement teams both in HMP Eastwood Park and HMP Style. Uh, so just to talk a little bit, I'll give you a bit of a, an introduction really of what I'm going to discuss today. So firstly, I will talk about our service and introduce you know, what support we offer and how we help the women in, uh, the, in custody. Then I'm going to reflect on how our service has adapted during the pandemic and the changes we've made. I'm going to then discuss social visits and how they've changed again during the pandemic and then reflect really on some uh, some of the practice and any key considerations and discuss those. Um, so firstly, if I just introduce the resettlement team, so I manage the two teams, both, as I said, in Eastwood Park and Style. Uh, we assess women who come into custody. Um, we cover a number of different pathways during our assessment, including finance benefit and debt, training, education and employment, sexual abuse, sexual violence, domestic abuse, um, health, substance misuse, relationships. Um, yeah, loads accommodation. We we cover a range a range of different pathways, uh, and then we'll basically identify the woman's needs and um, support them with that. So you know whatever support we can put in place or to help them, we will. So the idea is that we. Um, reduce reoffending and settle people back into the community so that they're, they're ready to then uh, continue with their journey. Um, in terms of how we've adapted now during the pandemic, we um, obviously things changed rapidly. Um, you know, I think, you know, you can all probably, you have all been through the same thing um, things come through quite thick and fast. And, um, you know, there was changes daily, um, you know, and, and lockdown was introduced. So at that time we stopped um, uh, seeing people face to face. So the majority of our work was face to face, having that contact with people, but that had to stop. So we trialled um, door drops for a short time. So we would drop the paperwork off to the women, um, you know, to, to uh, reduce any risk of uh, 
passing on you know, the COVID virus and we would take them back up and still support them. So they still got that support. Um, we then very quickly moved on to remote uh, contact. So our teams were able to be added to the women's pins and then um, we confirm them and have that contact. So it's, it's much better. You know, we get to talk to the women, we get to really listen to them and, and you know, we can give them advice over the phone as well and, and solve some of the, the concerns there. Um, and we can talk to them about what support we're going to put in place. And we've had some lovely feedback, really, from the women, um, you know, to say that's worked really, really well. So so that's worked great. Um, the prison changed, obviously, a lot during lockdown. The regime changed and the women were in their cells quite a lot of the day. They were allowed out, I think, for two half an hour, half an hour exercise sessions. Sessions, and they even would pick up their, their canteen and take it back to their room um, to eat. And um, so, yeah, just, just to stop that spread, really, or the potential risk of any spread. Uh, all social visits stopped. So there was no contact, uh, you know, immediately that was that was stopped straight away. Um, in terms of how we've moved forward, so into with the social visits, um, purple visits were introduced about three months ago. Um, so their visits via a laptop, which have proved really, really successful. Um, they've been really, you know, there's been a high uptake on social visits. Um, the women have really found them beneficial and, and we've had some feedback from the women to, to, to say this. Um, physical visits have started up recently, um, but the uptake is not as high for um physical visits now. Most people, in fact, are opting out of physical visits. There are some changes. Uh, so if any physical visits go ahead now, people have to wear masks. There can only be a maximum of three family members during this period. And there is no sort of physical touch. So, you know, mum and dad can't hug children and, and, and vice versa. So, you know, it's working as best it can at the moment, but social visits have really taken off. Um, uh, you know, looking at why and, and thinking about the, the sort of the key considerations, things to think about. You know, we cover, especially in Eastwood Park, such a large geographical area. We support women right over from sort of West Wales, uh, right over to Oxfordshire, down to Cornwall, um, and up to even Birmingham. So we cover a huge area. And the cost involved and, you know, the resources for women and their families to come and visit them is is huge. You know, whether that be petrol fare or um, train fare, the cost is really high. And, you know, for a lot of families, they haven't got that they're not you know they haven't got those means available to, to spend that many weekly or, or you know even even once a month um so that's one thing that social visits and um, the purple visits will help with is women then being able to have those visits from family members without the, the huge cost involved and um, it also helps with um if you've got elderly family uh, that can't travel or maybe even um somebody that's extremely ill that's unwell uh, that can't get out of bed that can't sit in hours you know a car for three four hours and um, you know the visits will help in that way as well um it also works with uh, siblings. So uh, some of our younger population have been potentially caregivers to their younger siblings uh, for, you know, for a long time. And they've they've got that nurturing and, and that nature uh, and care for them. Um, and if mum and dad can't, they're unable to or they, they they're not uh, having all the resources to bring them into custody to visit their siblings, then social visits, their purple visits again will help with that. Um, it's very much a trauma informed space as well, where um, the visits are conducted so it's it's very much like it looks a bit like a classroom so it's colorful it's bright it's uh, it doesn't look like a custodial setting so if you've got any younger children especially who are concerned you know if they've maybe watched on the news what prisons look like or, or they've seen things on the telly and um, and they're worried you know about where, where mum will be then this could ha absolutely help them in seeing that mum's fine you know she's in a lovely space it's nice and clean it's bright it's colorful so so that should alleviate some of their fears as well um in terms of sort of key considerations and moving forward um I think social visits are, are fantastic and I know it's really hard sometimes to, especially during a pandemic, to find some positive that's come out of this period and this year of our lives. But I think purple visits are definitely, you know, high up on that list. This is a, a real benefit that's come out. I think especially with, um, we've been forced really as a society to start using technology and, you know, even the sort of the elder gener generation have started to, to use uh, FaceTime more or Zooms or, you know, being able to contact loved ones that way. So this this has helped um, in with purple visits as well. You know, we've got that older generation who are able, more able to to use technology in this way. Um, I think a real key consideration is this needs to, you know, continue. I think it's fantastic, but what I would be fearful of is that, or the risk is, 
that we lose physical contact. Um, I would be fearful that it would be lost. So if paper visits do take off and they work really well, you know, physical visits then dwindle, which I think would be a real shame. Uh, people still need that contact. They still need, you know, that physical touch, even when the pandemic's over and, and visits go back to normal. You know, children need to see mum physically and to be able to hug her and, you know, and give her a kiss. So I think we need to really bear that in mind. So definitely positive, definitely the way forward, but just something to, to you know, keep in mind, really, um, when we're moving forward. Um, in terms of the women, uh, we were speaking to, I think the, the women's voice is key. This is about the, the women for us. Um, and it's about hearing them and hearing what they think of, of how things have moved forward. I think they were quite receptive to the fact that, um, you know, visits stopped and, and lockdown happened. I think they were very much along the lines of this has happened to everybody. It's not just us. You know, we're not being penalised at all. This is across the board. Even, you know, family and friends on the outside would be affected. Um, they were also given extra pin um, uh, money so they could ring family and friends a lot more than they, they could before. So they, they knew what was happening on the outside, you know, and through the news and things. So they seemed really receptive to things stopping. Um, they've been so fantastically positive about purple visits. We have one lady, I think I, I'll leave you with this because I think it's, it's the most important thing is the woman's voice. But one lady who said that she, she's she been in on a very long sentence. She has an 18 year old daughter who she hasn't seen for a long time, a number of reasons why she couldn't be uh, coming to visit. But because of purple visits now, she's been able to have contact with uh, her daughter, which is fantastic. She was at the moon. Uh, in her words, she said it was life changing. So I think that says, you know, that says it all really. It sums it up for me. Um, so yeah, she couldn't speak highly enough of it. And she's got that now to go outside to. She's building those relationships ready for when her sentence ends. She's got something to look forward to, something to plan for. So yeah, it is fantastic. Uh, thank you very much for listening for me, to me today. Um, I hope you found some of the information useful. And yeah, thank you very much. And <clears throat> thank you, Hayley. Right. Uh, the third presentation we've got is is live and um, we have uh, Victoria or Vicky Evans, who's a case manager at Hillside Secure Children's Home in South Wales, Neath. And we've also with her, we've got David Richmond, who oversees youth custody in Wales. Uh, he's the head of youth custody service in Wales. So uh, we've got a, a sort of slight oversight plus a, a hands on practice. Yeah, welcome both of you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very grateful for giving the opportunity to talk today. Um, the, in essence, there are three main domains modes of actually communication with um, families. So there were prior to COVID and, and, and uh, since COVID and we've actually fo focused on uh, letters, uh, video and face to face. Um, Vicky, what was your experience in, in Hillside before actually um, COVID in relation to those three domains? Um, obviously, the young people's um, contact is identified in their initial planning meeting. So then we decide in the planning meetings whether visits are supervised, whether there's restrictions around letters and visits. Um, so then obviously the young people, because of the fact that they, they attend education here and they attend um, other sessions with like the support services team, we do try and limit some of the visits to um, for families uh, once or twice a week, depending on the numbers we have at the centre at the time. Um, so for us, um, we tend to say, for example, the young people who live locally or nearby, um, tend to have more visits than those further afield. So, so um, and also sometimes circumstances don't allow families to visit depending on the young people. So for myself in relation to that question, it varies and it's unique to each young person that comes through the door. That's great. I mean, we are, we've, in terms of actually uh, for the other establishment, for those who um, may not know, there are actually three different types of um, establishments for young people in custody. Um, secure children's homes like Hillside, um, there's actually YOIs, youth offending institutions like the one at Park, and there's also secure training centres, of which there's two in England. And in response to the lockdown, um, uh, effectively, as uh, uh, everything closed uh, pretty much in terms of actually obviously um, visits. But what we became quite clear, and, and Corinne's already mentioned this, 
is that uh, connection is one of the four main key regime priorities uh, in addition to um, feeding, medication and safety. And are built around that, YCS also uh, um, uh, emphasised connection with families being important. Um, Vicky, how did actually Hillside adapt to the, the lockdown and what processes were put in place that uh, to help um, connect to the families? Um, obviously, when the face-to-face -face visit stopped, um, we we were able to facilitate visits via using um, Skype, Zoom and Microsoft Teams. So a lot of our visit professionals were done via Teams. So we held meetings such as LACs and SARS and stuff via Teams. Um, we had visits for uh, young people of Skype. They, they, they depended on um, whether the parents had the facilities for Skype or so on. Um, we obviously uh, increased the phone calls um, in coming and outgoing. Um, because obviously we had to support the young people and the parents with the pandemic. Some parents wanted to know we were keeping the young people safe. The, um, some young people wanted to know that their parents were safe through the pandemic. Um, we, what we what we were fortunate to do was that um, it be, we, we didn't have any trouble as such with regards to the visits because in fact some young people who live further afield were having more visits and more contact via um, your Microsoft Teams or your Skype. So um, we we did have some issues where some young people who obviously we work with complex individuals, they struggled not not being able to hug their parents and sort of seeing somebody face to face a bit, you know, it was strange for us as adults. So, so the young people needed a bit more time to adjust as well, because obviously it, um, it was strange for us as well, working via Teams for meetings and so on, because, you know, face to face contact is a lot different. But um, we seem to sort of um, adjust to it pretty quickly. They, we increased the visits. Um, and, I, and I think that it, it made social workers a little bit easier for them to do their visits as well. I think that's really interesting. Uh, some of the actual challenges that were faced um, on, a, on a broader perspective was, as you mentioned already, um, access to in the internet, whether that was available. Um, we also had issues around actually equipment nationally, um, just getting the right equipment in place. You can appreciate, as Corinne mentioned already, uh, there was a lot of activity to, to um, increase the capacity to uh, facilitate video calls. And that logistically just took a lot of uh, energy and effort. Um, uh, social visits were restarted. Um, uh, I, I know it's um, Park in uh, the end of July and social visits started, um, that's face-to-face -face visits at Hillside on the 3rd of August. In terms of actually sort of um, the challenges, is, is actually, um, whilst I think small places like Hillside cope really well, um, big organisations, the bigger sites, um, to actually prepare for this, actually, in terms of lessons, is preparation for emergency planning is certainly probably high up on the agenda. Um, we also introduced a, a parents forum at um, Park because um, the dynamic wasn't simply one of connecting um, between young people and parents uh, on a one to one basis. It's also the wider information that can be given to to, to parents and also the wider information given to other parts of the community, the youth offending teams who facilitate outside of that connection uh, dialogue between parents and, and the, the children. We also actually involved, as you know, with Hillside, the Children's Commissioner um, in this. So, so we made sure that actually that um, the Children's Commissioner were able to give their input to how we can actually improve from a child's perspective um, the position. Um, and we also looked at the specific Welsh language perspectives. Um, were there any other sort of big challenges that you found actually at, uh, at Hillside at all, Vicky? Um, yeah, I, I think that what, what we found was that, um, especially for young people that were transitioning back into the community, um, it impacted on um, restrictions, um, such as mobilities, um, transition plans when it came to sort of visiting pl future placements, visiting um, potential um, people, because obviously when they meet new people, it's, you know, difficult for anybody. So to meet somebody who's going to be looking after them in the, in the community face to face was a bit difficult via um, teams and so on. Plus, I think some of the young people struggled because whereas their contact was unsupervised, um, because of the internet and the restrictions and the, and the availability to go on to other things, they had to have staff in the room during a visit so that made it then a little bit more difficult in relation to sort of having that private time with um, your parents or family or friends where staff just outside the room. 
That sounds brilliant. I mean, it's certainly in terms of actually um, for our lessons nationally, we looked at actually that need to uh, focus on the participation standards, which actually apply in Wales, and also to focus on sort of three areas, information, communication, uh, families and communities. It's not just simply arranging visits. It's, it's mm -hmm. part of a wider um, uh, uh, um, approach and, um, and facilitation. The voice of actually the service user was critical to this uh, and to actually hear their voices and to actually listen to their lived experience, uh, which we've done. Um, I also think it's quite interesting the issue around confidentiality, um, of which purple visits actually provides a, a level of confidentiality which doesn't exist in relation to other types of visits because it's it's it usually it's monitored as you may be aware uh, through um, uh, various AI as opposed to physically somebody observing the actual conversation. Um, we've had, as I said um, earlier, considerations around parents and to enhance the actual communication. One of the things that we're developing at Park is actually parents' reports. Uh, to make it a much more enhanced um, experience and to foster the communication and to, between parents and the children. Because sometimes they, they, it's, you can imagine that um, parents and, 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 uh, and their children struggle to, um, to find, to talk through difficult areas like how they're doing in education, for example. And as Vicky alluded to, focus on the actual um, transition into the community was also is, is important to cover. So they're broadly speaking the sort of areas we, we, we actually were able to, 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 to um, explore and, and was continuously learning. Vicky, is there anything else you want to add? No, you know, and obviously we, we have, um, we've still, you know, facilitated lots of things via not just visits. We've we've got young people having sessions with um, potential such as music sessions with YMCA's in the community and stuff via Zoom. So, you know, there has been positives and we are continuing to do the best we can with this current situation because obviously um, there's lots of areas that's gone into lockdown. So we have to be, we've had to put a stop again on visits at the minute because of like restrictions in certain areas. So we are trying to do the best, you know, obviously the best we can in relation to it. So, you know, credit what credit's due. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we have to shut you off there, I'm afraid. Uh, give us time to get the last speaker in before they, before we throw it open to everybody. So thank you very much, both of you, and thanks to all all the speakers so far. Um, right, the the uh, the last talk is um, we're very fortunate to have uh, guests from Wisconsin in the United States, nine o'clock in the morning there, and uh, these are Julie. Poilman Tynan, who's, I have to read it out, the Dorothy A. O'Brien Professor of Human Ecology and is also Professor of Human Development and Family Studies at Wisconsin Madison University. And with her is uh, Elizabeth Scora Horgan, who's the Shannon Graduate Fellow in Early Childhood Development and a doctoral student in the same university. I hope I've got that right. Uh, I emailed out their paper yesterday and some today as well, and I hope you've managed to get at least a quick look at her paper. So Julie and Liz, welcome, and uh, we're looking forward to what you have to say. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, thanks for inviting us. Um, we are really happy to be here and to have heard um, what is going on in uh, Wales, and we'd like to talk about how we focused on video visits even before the pandemic and then also what's happened since then and i just want to add the caveat that we're not saying that video visits are the best way to visit obviously kids do best when they can have a child-friendly contact visit with their parents who are incarcerated so they can hug and do activities together. It's just those aren't as common. Um, so I'll start by giving just a little bit of background and why we started thinking about remote in-home video visits in corrections even before the pandemic. Uh, the first reason is that research has consistently shown that more parent-child contact during uh, and incarceration leads to less recidivism and better parent-child relationships upon re-entry. And the second reason is that, well, in the United States, most incarceration occurs in jails, which are equivalent to like pre 
trial pre-sentencing detention centers, and they also hold people um, who are sentenced of really small, like misdemeanor crimes. And in a 2015 survey that my colleagues conducted, they found that the vast majority of visits that were happening in jails were behind plexiglass. And several studies that I've conducted where we've interviewed people and observed kids found that plexiglass visits were particularly stressful, even more so than video visits or in-person visits. And we found that a lot of incarcerated parents and children's caregivers said they didn't like to bring children in to visit behind the glass, that they felt it was stressful as well. So um, Liz will talk about the other uh, main reason why we focused on that. Thanks, Julie. So I'm really excited to hear how many prisons have been trialing video chat and utilizing the purple visits that I've heard about. That's fantastic because the research really suggests that video chat is a beneficial form of communication for children of all ages. In 2016, the American Academy of Pediatrics redid their recommendations for media use, and they actually say that despite limitations on media, um, like television and apps and games, they recommend video chat for children from birth. And one of those reasons is that video chat is really easy to use, um, can connect people across large geographical areas, and it can also reduce the costs of connection, especially when in-person visits may not be possible due to just the distance between a family member and in this case, their incarcerated parent video can offer a substitute for that when necessary. Uh, video chat is socially contingent, which means that both parties are relying on the other's social cues for their interaction, and it can really support diverse communication styles. So common forms of contact when a parent or family member is incarcerated, like email or letters and phone calls, aren't necessarily developmentally appropriate for young children who haven't fully grasp the concept of um, other. So if they can't see the person, they can't use gestures and play, it can be really hard for them to have meaningful connections. So uh, research has suggested that video chat enables children to form social connections, enables them to learn new content from their social partner on the screen. And it also um, has been shown to lead to greater positive effect and contentment between a parent and a child when they interact, um, as opposed to just an audio only visit, so like a phone call. And also um, really interestingly, research has found that there's comparable interaction quality and levels of play between in-person interactions and video chat interactions with a parent and a child. Again, I want to reiterate that we are not suggesting that video visits are um, should be used in place of contact visits. Contact visits are always the gold standard, but when they're not available, there are numerous benefits to video visits. Um, that being said, it is important to consider the context. There are a lot of contextual challenges like um, systemic influence of corrections policies and the context of the prison itself or the jail. Um, and the child's home setting and the availability of their caregiver, and also their access to tech. So those are really important considerations um, to weigh when deciding how to utilize video visits. And Julie actually has a really exciting study going on that she'll tell you a little bit about. Right, in order to address some of those contextual issues that can be really important in um, the Enha um, enhancing the quality of children's visits. My colleagues and I at uh, University of Wisconsin started an enhanced visits project, and it was designed to really address the inequalities that we see in people's access to visits and the benefits of visits. So in our uh, project, we provide tablets to families so they can connect internet connections if they don't have them. And we actually pay for visits um, through in-home video visits for three months. Um, and, and those occur every day. And in the United States, families are responsible for paying for the visits, which are usually about 25 cents a minute. 
And so it can be very costly for people to engage in these kind of visits without support. So our preliminary findings have uh, been very positive. Families have said that they really enjoy the visits, that it, it gives them access to things that they wouldn't experience in jail, such as you saw on the first video, like the parents being able to be there for a child's birthday party or uh, an incarcerated parent um, supervising um, uh, brushing teeth or homework or being there for a mealtime or even a holiday. And so there are some benefits um, that they talked about. And also children themselves said, oh, I'd rather curl up on my couch or play um, with my parent instead of actually going to the jail. So um, these were all things we were thinking about even before the pandemic. So Liz is just going to talk about um, how this relates to what people are experiencing during the pandemic. Yeah, thanks, Julie. So with the pandemic, in-person visits were just completely taken away, not an option. So as we've heard, a lot of prisons were left scrambling for how to help kids connect. And it was really, it still is a very scary time for both kids and their family members. They're worried about safety, they're worried about health, they're just worried about when they'll be able to see each other again. So especially during this pandemic, it's crucial for considering video visits an option to connect family members with their distanced relatives. And as we've heard from the other speakers, there are concerns to this, like encryption and how to pay for the visits and access to technology, but the overwhelming benefits that enable kids to communicate better, enables them to play with their incarcerated parent, participate in longer and richer periods of communication. They can experience eye contact from their parent or family member and have playful interactions together. Um, really make this a viable option that should be considered as a way to help families get through the pandemic during while they're separated. Thank you so much. And um, please let us know if you have any questions. Well, thank you very, very much. Julian, Liz, and uh, and the, all the other speakers as well, and everybody's kept to time, which is wonderful. Made my job easy. Gets a bit harder now, though. Um, first of all, latecomers, can you please switch off audio and camera unless you're going to speak? Um, right. The other thing is uh, for for people who who didn't hear at the beginning, where uh, the, it, if you want to ask a question or make a comment, and everybody's very welcome to do that, uh, please put it in the chat uh, on the on the right of the. Uh, if if you click on the uh, along the little band at the bottom, you'll see a sort of speech bubble. If you click on that, you can then type. Uh, the, the chat comes up and you can type a message at the bottom and it'll, it'll show. We've got a couple of comments uh, and questions so far, but before uh, <clears throat> before we go to those, I'm going to start with some brief comments uh, from Maria and Cara. I hope they're there from the charity Children Heard and Seen and possibly Eloise as well, who I see has put a message up there. If you could come on and uh, did they want you wanted to say something quickly, and I think it'd be very helpful about from the perspective of families because you work with the children and families. Is that right? So, so welcome. So, give us a quick, quick input. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, hi there. Um, this isn't. Um, it, yeah, it, it is just about kind of how the families are, are experiencing um video calls, um, and I think it's just to create a, a little bit of balance as, as well because it and it's not to take away from the positives, but. I think some balance is required and um, just in terms of that there are significant problems with functionality and create and, and connectivity with um, the purple visit system and families have reported to us significant difficulties of having to re-verify themselves regularly throughout a call um, and other things around not everyone has access to a smartphone or internet connectivity which are, are required for a video call not everyone has the IT skills required to set up and manage a video call. Um, there are issues around where English isn't the first language of, of people in accessing completing the application process. Um, some people don't have access to a passport, a driving license or other government issued photo ID, which are, are required. And the cost of buying a passport may well be prohibitive for some families. 
Um, video calls are largely available during the week. Um, so if families are working, children are back at school now, being able to time a, a call, it's not always accessible. Um, so, um, the, so the families could all be in different locations and because the children are at school, they're not all in the same place, so they can't all be on one call at the same time. And it also might mean that their employer isn't aware that they've got a loved one in custody so it's not just as easy as saying oh well I'm just nipping out for my lunch to, to take the to, to you know to have this video call um the other significant issue is that if the other parent was the victim of the offense say there was a dv case um and they're the only other adult in the household it has to be an adult who is the account holder so some families may avoid video calls because they don't want the perpetrator to be effectively in their front room um, or it will be traumatising for the other parent because they will do the call because they want the children to have access to the parents so they'll kind of deal with the trauma of it. Um, and the other concern is around the facial recognition software. Um, and I know we've heard about children being able to play and be interactive with their parents. In terms of the purple visit system, that isn't the case. There is a requirement to be very, very still while you're on the call, because if you're not, it cuts out and, and there's a need for re-verification. So just that that's a particular issue. Um, and there are also concerns amongst families around the storage of data and who stores the data, where it's stored and what happens if there is a breach of that data. Um, so I'll hand you over to Maria now, but that's just some of the issues that have come up in terms of discussions with the, with the families. I, uh, I also think that some of the families have just said that it's just too painful to actually have a have a you know a virtual call um and for you know not to be able to uh, touch or hug that is something that is really missing which holds them back from doing it through fear of it being too painful and another family well a couple of families that we've been working with the actual you know the amount of people that you're al allowed to have on the actual video call you know they they're then having to choose between which of their children are allowed to see their mother this month on a virtual call, which has just been, you know, absolutely heartbreaking for them. Um, but one of the things that I did do was just ask, I thought it might be nice for everyone here to hear from some, I know that they can't be here, but to hear um, just a couple of perspectives of families who have or haven't experienced the, the calls. So I've got them recorded, which I'm just gonna play for you now. Hi, our experience of um, virtual visits, it's good and bad. It's good that I don't have to take the children to into the prison but bad because um the calls keep cutting out so the last time we had one it cut out three times so they only probably got to speak to their dad for probably about 10 minutes this next one's um from a child's perspective my experience um on virtual visiting um it's both it's good and bad but i love going to see him more in person just because I can see him like in the flesh whereas on virtual um, it's a bit difficult as well because it keeps cutting off and it um, we don't get as much time and I don't get to speak to my dad as often and at the end it just cuts off without us knowing so we don't get to say goodbye or like we still haven't had a virtual visit because originally my partner's prison wanted to charge us £30 for 30 minutes of a virtual visit. They then decided that they would allow virtual visits, but only two prisoners a week. So I doubt they've even got to my partner's name on the list yet. Having no visual contact for over 180 days, which is so long for children to not see their parent, we was disappointed with our video call, literally 30 seconds in and we had to verify. This happened continuously for 12 minutes. Then it seemed the connectivity at the prison was unstable, so we had to keep restarting. After 20 minutes, we gave up, hadn't held a conversation, just managed to have a glimpse of each other. That left us very disheartened. Right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, that's real food for thought in that. Um, so we can get some responses to that. Um, could all our speakers now uh, come put their video and um, speech on as well? Speakers on as well, please. <coughs> and uh, David Richmond, you had your hand up, uh, <coughs> so uh, maybe you could come in first. Yeah, I'd just like to a few things. Is that one is actually um, uh, as been uh, as mentioned. 
the uh, purple visits is is actually a video call. It's not a visit, um, and um, it's a misnomer to call it a visit. Um, equally, um, it's not a substitute um, uh, to actual real visits. Uh, and if anything, I feel that they quite strongly that we should be advocating real visits and actually mm -hmm. and looking at ways to actually bring them back online as quickly as possible and supporting those visits. And just wanted to mention in relation to young people, uh, there is schemes actually out there to support the financial because there's, there's obviously costs. And what actually uh, COVID has actually uh, highlighted is that parents quite rightly need those costs up front rather than claiming them once they, because they haven't got the money to uh, afford a, a lent, a quite expensive fare to travel to the prison. So we've actually looked at ways to actually uh, make that a much more streamlined process. So um, uh, I get quite um, uh, energised by uh, the need to um, make this experience in relation to real visits more real uh, and more frequent. Uh, and the feedback that people have had in terms of their experiences is really valid to actually to um, strengthen that call. Does anybody else like to come in uh, on that? I mean, we could link this with a general question from Kate Williams, which was about how big was the problem with digital poverty of the families with the purple visit system at all. So not not just uh, money and so on, uh, but but actually having it, having the equipment and and the and being used to using that sort of thing. I don't know what experiences any of you have had with that. Does anyone want to come in on that? You know the hand thing. If you click on the three dots, you can you can stick your hand up. It says raise your hand. Ah, great. Okay. Yeah, Julie. Julie, you haven't. You've got. You need to put your audio on as well. You kept your microphone. Oh, okay. Um, I can't really comment on the purple visits because that's not something that we studied. But we um, found that in the jails in the United States that it was at least half of the incarcerated parents and their families did not have access to either an internet connection or, or a smartphone or tablet or um, understanding of how to use the software, et cetera. And that's why we developed our intervention program is to address some of these issues and kind of equalize the playing field. Great, thanks. Um, and there's another question here from um, Helen Louise Codd, who's a professor in University of Central Lancashire. Uh, I'm really I interested. Like, yeah. yeah, it wasn't really a question. It's more just a sort of comment, really, because I, I'm obviously I'm working on prisoners and their families and their children. Um, but I'm also back doing work I started doing 30 years ago on older prisoners um, and age friendly nursing cities and prisons. And I'm just really interested in what one of the things I was hurt, I, it was just a comment really, it wasn't really a question, but about the way in which it's actually, where the visits work, obviously, allowing particularly elderly people in the community and elderly relatives, for example, to interact in ways they wouldn't before because of mobility issues or poverty or whatever, or health. And that was just a comment. It wasn't really a question. It was just a comment, Mike. Mm -hmm. Anyone got thoughts? The elderly, vulnerable, disabled issue, particularly. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Hayley, Morris. Hi, yeah. Um, we've had, um, just in, in answer to some of the questions there, we've had a big uptake with Purple Visits. Um, and there are, have been a lot of issues prior with the initial getting them onto the system and all that kind of thing. It's settled down a little bit now. Um, and also regards to um, what the lady was just saying there, the family member has to download an app on their side so um that's how when we've facilitated visits with guys with someone that can't get to prison as long as they've got the smartphone and they can um download the app then okay. there's there's been no issues there mm -hmm. right, thank you so they, they could have family members helping them to use mm -hmm. use the app as well because an elderly person might not be able to use the app but they could have another family member mm. go around to the house and help them because we've had that a few times as well right thank you okay. um i've got one here from henry smithers just can you clarify whether there is a cost for families to access purple visits in england and wales 
Because it, it sounds as if there, were, there could be. Does anyone know the answer to that? Uh, yeah, Hayley uh, Simpson. Hello. Um, yeah, there's not a cost at the moment. So I'm not for um, any purple visits in Eastwood Park. Whether that changes in the future, I don't know. Um, but there's not a cost at the moment. I think that's been picked up by the prison because of the, the pandemic. Um, but can I just comment as well? There was a point yeah. earlier about the day um, that said, you know, this is not a one size fits all. And I think they're absolutely right. This needs to be a real combination of, you know, physical visits, as everybody has said, are they're really, really important. Um, but then, you know, using the, the purple visits as well. Um, so, yeah, it's a combination and not just one thing. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, uh, there was a question here about uh, any stats from Claire Price saying, are there any stats on the proportion of offenders who have been able to have a purple visit? And Stuart Harrington has answered, Purple Visits is up and running in 107 pro, uh, prisons at the moment. So that's that's the great majority. It's probably about 70, 70, 80 percent, isn't it? Something like that. Yeah. Um, somebody, uh, uh, Maria, is it, uh, Kerlich, uh, wanted to support the point about using the term video call, not virtual visit. Do you want to, do you want to say something about that, uh, Maria? Uh, yeah, just, just to flag up, really, that it's very important with um, within this fluidity that we've got, that we don't lose sight of the foundations, you know, uh, and prisoner statutory rights are, are very, very important foundations to anything that we do. But obviously we have to cope with the fluidity on top of that. But just I didn't want to lose sight of that. Yeah, thanks. Uh, is your hand still up, Hayley, or is that people? Oh. Yep. Uh, Hayley Morris. Uh, just going back to the question about the cost, what we were told going forward um, after it's going to be free through the pandemic um, and whenever that does end, um, that the cost will be picked up. But after that, it will be £5 for 30 minutes and um, £10 for an hour. Wow. But that's still cheaper than someone having to bring five children onto trains you know, over over South Wales or wherever the prison is. Mm. Julie, did you have your hand up earlier? It, it was hidden by something, I think. Uh, or, no? Oh, I, I didn't, but... No, um, no. Oh, well, you so, say something if you like. <laughs> yeah. uh, I was just going to say that um, I do think in the United States, at least, the video calls are quite expensive at 25 cents a minute especially considering that most people who use other platforms in the community have a very low cost. Um, and in the United States, the it's because the um, systems are run by for-profit companies, which is really different. And so many of us um, try to, you know, advocate for free, or extremely low cost um, visits, but the system really needs to change in order for that to happen, at least in the in the US. Yeah. Uh, David, you, you wanted to say something? I'll, I'll come back to Cara in a second. Uh, you need to put um, your, yeah, okay. Some prisons and um, certainly Park and others have access to Skype, which obviously is a different facility, it's a different platform and obviously different costs. Um, so, um, uh, and actually it has a functionality which maybe has pluses and minuses. Um, so it's, it's as people are saying, people need to be quite varied with this rather than one size fits all. Um, and actually also look at actually the um, effectively at the end of the day, come what may, we ha um, the objective and the outcome, which is the important one, is to value and to enhance the relationship between parents and children um on, on both sides and to do the best we can for that um, um I, and i know also part for one uh are being very flexible in terms of the amount of time the amount of occasions i just hope that others are able uh, subject their resources to do similar things thanks uh cara you 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 were going to uh, add something uh, and maybe uh, eloise as well from the same organization she's she's made a point about um uh, having to wait several months to, to get a, on a video call. Yeah, just very quickly picking up on the costs. I mean, what we've been told that it's going to be um, five ninety nine for thirty minutes, and it, it was it is cheaper than a, an actual social visit. You're not comparing like with like. Social visits are confidential. 
video calls aren't confidential they're recorded and they're also observed so they're very very different and and also they're very very limited in their scope in terms of time and accessibility because at the moment they're once a month and I, I think we just need to think about like David was saying that there are alternatives like in Northern Ireland they use Zoom they haven't had any difficulties in Northern Ireland in terms of, of using a different platform um, and, I, and I just think we need to be careful about assuming that purple visits are some kind of panacea because they're not. There, there's lots of issues around it and lots of issues around the whole calls and visits arrangements at the moment. Yeah. Is, is Eloise there? Do you want to add something from from the same organisation? No, I think she's disappeared. Uh, oh, hi, I'm here. Oh, right. Did you want to add anything? Um, not really. I just guess we reiterate the point that you know several of the families that I'm supporting, um, there's eight children, there's ten children, which means that actually even within two months they can't see their parent and on the visit, and actually that's um, you know impacting the children because in some cases the parent will be choosing the younger child to be on the visit every time, which means that the younger children are waiting several months to see them, and I think that's a big problem because obviously one of the carers or parents needs to be on that video as well. So then it is limited to three children. That was what I was going to say. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. OK, well, we, we've sort of gone over our time, but uh, uh, we did have a thought that uh, we don't have to stop exactly at four, um, but maybe we should begin to draw it to a close. I suppose the if any of the speakers could have give a give a view on how much of this will last as it were you know in three or four years time do you think where will we be we will we be with with these this new technology and so on or do you think we'll go back to, to where we were has it has it changed anything permanently has anybody got particular views on that um, um my Greg, i've got to go in a minute but what yeah. i would like to say this is um just what what we try to do is look at different ways we're not by any means saying that purple mm. visits is going to overtake um social visits or mm. any of our family interventions as corin said um you know we run all sorts of different ways to connect children with their fathers and family members and um this is just one of them um yeah. and the fact is everything was shut down um the hmpps have to think of something and think of something fast you yes. know, there's always errors, and and when there's a pilot, it takes always there's teeth and issues. Um, and but we are having a lot of social visits as well, so children are coming in to see their dad. They can't hug, but what we've done is we've done physical barriers, so we've put trellises in between, um, and things like that. And this, they are still coming in with their children. Yeah. Um, you can only have a bottle of water. The cafe shirts, the play area shirt, but they're coming in because they want yep. to see dad, whether it's yep. two meters or not. So you're you're kind of agreeing with. I think we had a comment yes. earlier from Maria saying there needs to be a combination of offers, yes. not a one size fits all. Yeah, I fully but, agree. But many prisons didn't have this facility before. No. They have now. So hopefully it'll 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 be another tool in the box. It'll it'll yeah. it'll it'll last. Yeah, and it, it's an yeah. add-on to what yeah. we, we hopefully will get back to. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, David first, and then and then uh, Julie. I just really wanted to, to emphasise that, uh, from my perspective, um, the voice of the families is is absolutely critical to this. Uh, and it may have been that prior to the um, pandemic, um, that that wasn't as strong as it should have been. Um, and and it may be still people feel it's quite a struggle to get their voices heard. But um, I can assure you that actually in terms of certainly young people, um, and I'm sure the case is, is similarly for adults, uh, there's a need to actually to in terms of moving into what we call recovery and reform is that the voices of, of families um, to be as a lot stronger and a lot more actually uh, attention paid to their experience, because that's critical to the success, as, as Julian and Liz have referred to. If we want our institutions to be successful in, in terms of, of um, positive outcomes and lifestyles and, uh, and choices, then the role of the parent is critical to that. Julie? And just um, elaborating on that, I think um, when families have a choice, of how they connect with their loved ones that is so important and so i think 
it's possible that the pandemic has um, caused more corrections institutions to develop additional ways for families to connect. And if that additional choice is available, that's wonderful. I, I just finished a study where we found that when families had a choice about what type of visit, mm. that the children's um, adjusted way better and their their well-being was higher than in families that, um, in in families that were had a, a person in a corrections facility that there was no choice at all and they had to do a, a visit in one certain way because you know as we've heard families have just different preferences and I think that's really important to honor yeah great uh, just before Haley uh, I, I just noticed there's a there's one from uh, Karen DeClaire, who I, I know is a researcher, has done some research in this area. Are you there, Karen? Do you want to do you want to add anything before we finish? Hi, yeah, uh, I just um, that was brilliant, guys. I really, really love that. So good, so interesting. But just um, during right through the <clears throat> the initial lockdown, we were collecting information from. Um, about 1,200 men across the prison service about their experience and visits was part of that. And although a lot of them were really, really positive about the virtual visits, um, being able to, one of the big things was being able to attend family funerals via iPad um, and, and other occasions like that, which they wouldn't have had access to before. There was a lot of positive. But what we're hearing now is some men coming back and saying to us, it's too painful for me to, to go into my family home without going into my family home. And I just think we need to remember that from both sides, from the, <clears throat> the guys who are our residents in our care and their families, we just genuinely, what people have been saying, we have to think about what's best for those individuals and offering them options is quite great. I've long been an advocate for virtual types of visits and phone calls because I know, um, you know, I've, I've followed Julie's work, so I know that there are a lot of issues for families around around visits. But we we actually have to make sure that we're not just making change for change's sake, that we're looking at what happens to each individual and what their needs are. Yeah. That seems to be a message coming over very strongly from this one. Two messages. One is you need options, not one size fits all. And secondly, you have to listen very carefully to what the prisoners and their families say. Uh, and there is a danger that people are so oh, this is this is cheaper. It's going to save them money and people think they know best. Uh, but sort of uh, you, you've got a, a blanket policy. It could be a very big mistake. Uh, do you want to have the last word, uh, Hayley Morris? And then I'm, I'm afraid we're going to have to stop, unfortunately. Uh, I, I just know, I just think I've said it all. I just oh, think, yeah, yeah, sorry, I, I thought, thought you had, but your hand was still up. <laughs> so, oh, sorry. Was, yeah, no, no problem at all. Okay, well, I, I better draw it to a close there. First of all, could I thank you all very, very much, all the speakers and, of course, all the uh, audience. Uh, it, was, it was very, uh, it was a big surprise to us how many people were interested in this. And thanks for your contributions from the floor, as it were. Um, just a couple of things to say. If First of all, if anyone wants any copies of the two papers that uh, Anna Clancy and I uh, have published or about to publish one of them on uh, Park Prison and, and the system there. Just email me and I'll send them to you. Uh, and secondly, um, we're going to, if this, if you feel this has worked, we're going to repeat this with another issue. And I think Katie Holloway will be the next one, probably in November. Uh, and that'll be on issues around substance misuse. So I th any feedback you want to give us on the format, et cetera, would be very, very helpful to us. So thank you all very, very much again. Thank you. And, uh, uh, we'll put the, we'll let you all know where the recording is when it's ready to go and uh, uh, see you again, I hope. So thanks Special very thanks much. Thanks to everybody. you, Mike. Special well, thanks to you uh, too as chair. No, I enjoyed it. Thank you very much.